All right, so let's go ahead and get started. We are talking about kelp forest today. So we're gonna be talking about what kelp is and who lives there and what's kind of going on with it. So guys, this is a very different topic than I'm used to. I've never swam in the kelp forest before. So I had to learn a lot to be able to teach you this as well. Um, so bear with me. Some of you might actually know more about kelp than me. So if I say something wrong, you know, just let me know um, and then we can correct it. But guys, first off, kelp, what do you guys think kelp is? I'll let you guys write this answer in the um, comments as well. What is kelp? Is kelp an animal, a plant, an algae, or a tree? Is kelp a plant, animal, algae, or a tree? What do you guys think? All right, so I see a lot of you are answering with the word plant. It's actually not a plant, it's an algae. All right, so kelp is actually an algae. It's in the kingdom Chromista. Um, I actually had no idea that kingdom even existed until I started looking into this lesson. Um, so it's in the kingdom Chromista. So it's plant-like. Um, but it's actually an algae. It's very similar to the zooxanthellae and the coral that we talked about. So it's actually not a plant. Kelp is not a plant. It's not an animal. It's not a tree. It's an algae. And algaes are not plants. They're actually different. So that is a big thing to note. Um, if you guys have printed out that worksheet, um, it's a comparison of all the different ecosystems we've learned about. It's got coral reefs, seagrass, mangroves, um, the Arctic, Antarctica, and kelp forests. And you can actually compare all the ecosystems that we've learned about to each other. So again, guys, kelp is not a plant. It is an algae. Um, so they are not related. It's in a completely different kingdom called Chromista. Um, some people think it's in the Protus kingdom, um, but Chromista is a new kingdom that we are, a new term that we're talking about now. Uh, so kelp grows in underwater forests. They can grow as much as 18 inches per day. So that's really, really fast. Kelp can grow really quickly. Um, again, 18 inches per day, that's very fast. Um, and kelp actually covers 25% of the world's coastlines. So a little bit more about kelp. Kelp has uh, leaf structures that we actually call blades. So their leaves are called blades. They have roots called holdfasts. Um, so again, they don't really, there aren't roots that go into the ground very much at all. If, uh, I think we talked about this in our seagrass lesson. A big difference with algae is that it just has hold fast. So it kind of just sticks to the ground or the rock or whatever it's on. There aren't really root light structures on it. The plant stalk, so the long part of that, uh, sorry, not, well, not the plant. The long part of the kelp is called the stipe. Um, so that's something as well. And then they have gas-filled structures. So the kelp has these little gas-filled balls called pneumatocysts, all right? So you guys probably might remember in our coral lessons, we have um, nematocysts, which is different. Nematocysts are the stinging cells. On our mangroves, we have pneumatophores, which are the roots. But in kelp, we have pneumatocysts. All right, so slightly different spelling. It's a little strange, I'm sorry. Um, but the pneumatocysts on the kelp are small little balls that are filled with gas and it helps them kind of stand up. If the kelp didn't have those gas filled balls, they would just be flopping over. So when you see pictures of kelp forests, um, that's why they're standing tall like that. So again, those are pneumatocysts. You can find kelp in areas that are a little bit colder actually, 43 to 57 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, they like temperate and polar coastal oceans. So you're going to find them near the coast. You're not going to find them in the open ocean. Um, but they like colder waters compared to our coral reefs, our seagrass, and our mangroves. But they don't like super cold like the Arctic or Antarctica. You can also find some of them in tropical waters. They found a kelp forest in Ecuador, um, and that's near the tropics. But the biggest thing about kelp is they're found in areas where there's a lot of upwelling. Upwelling is when nice colder, deeper water comes up to more shallower area. So it goes up. So areas of upwelling is where you're going to see your kelp forests. Um, there's a lot of kelp, especially near the coast of California. So kelp is very important as a habitat, which we'll get into in a little bit, but it's also important for commercial use. So that means that we humans actually use it. 
So between 100,000 to 170,000 tons of kelp is harvested from California waters every single year. So again, I'll say that again, 100,000 to 170,000 tons of kelp is taken from California waters per year. That's a lot. Um, and we do a lot of different things with that. Before I move on and tell you about that, I do want you guys to know that the kelp harvest in California is very highly regulated. You have to have a permit. It's not like you can just take kelp. Um, so it's a very regulated type of practice. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. So they actually can break kelp down into what we call kelp ash. It's rich with iodine and alkali, which is used in soap and glass production. They can also get what we call soda ash. Um, so soda ash, um, it's a very fine powdery thing. You can kind of see it there. If you can see that, sure. Um, so they use soda ash and they use that soda ash from the kelp to thicken things. So toothpaste, ice cream, jelly, and even salad dressing. They use soda ash, which can come from kelp, to thicken things like that. So your toothpaste, your ice cream, your jelly, your salad dressing might actually have kelp product in it. Um, they also use kelp as an ingredient um, for teeth impressions at the dentist. So if you guys have ever been to the dentist, you know um, you might have had, especially if you have braces, they shove that big, uh, like, squishy mouth thing in your mouth to get an imprint of your teeth. And the that gooey stuff that you're putting your teeth in, that actually has kelp products in it as well. So kelp is actually very useful for a lot of things that we use very often. It's also a renewable resource. So I thought this was very, very cool. Um, they actually can use it into what we call a biofuel. So a biofuel, think about just the word fuel, okay? Your cars, your fossil fuels, right? Um, but we all know that fossil fuels are not renewable. So there's only so many fossil fuels um, and we need other things. So solar is a renewable resource, right? Wind energy, water energy, that's all renewable resource. Kelp is also a renewable resource. You can actually turn kelp into a biofuel to run your cars. Um, so kelp actually gives off a lot of methane and sugars that can be converted into ethanol. Um, so we call it a biofuel again, and this is, I might say this word wrong, but they use a process called thermochemical liquefaction, All right? So thermochemical liquefaction is how they turn kelp into a fuel that we could use to power our cars. So what they do is they dry the kelp out, they wash all the salt off of it, and they turn it into a biofuel through very high temperature and high pressure. So they put it through really, really high temperature and a lot of pressure, and it creates a biofuel. Now, there are a lot of pros to this. Um, it's a renewable resource, so that means that we can grow it, and it's a lot better. It's less pr uh, pollution in the environment, um, and that's a big selling point as well. And it also creates byproducts. So byproducts are just, think about when you make, um, think about when you are cooking meat on the stove and you have the meat, but then you also have the grease left over. Or think about bacon, how about that? You're cooking the bacon, after you cook the bacon, you have this leftover grease. That's a byproduct. And you can actually use that byproduct, that bacon grease, to cook something else in it, and we'll give it a, a nice flavor. So that's what a byproduct is. So when you are making the kelp into a biofuel, you get other byproducts as well that can actually be helpful for other things. So not a lot is going to waste when you are turning kelp into a biofuel, and that's a very, very um, good thing. But there are some cons to using kelp for biofuel. Um, it's a newer concept, so I mean, it's not a very popular thing going on right now. There's still a lot to learn. It can get very expensive, and it can lead to habitat degradation if it's not being done right. If we're taking too much kelp out of the ocean, we're going to have a big impact on the habitat. Um, I see some of you are asking what that term was. Thermochemical liquefaction, okay? Thermochemical liquefaction, that is the process. All right, so guys, other benefits of kelp, it actually is a buffer um, from rough, rough water onto the shore. So it protects the shoreline from rough waters. 
just like seagrass, just like corals and mangroves, it protects the shoreline from rougher seas, especially on the coast where these um, kelp forests exist. They have bigger waves, so the shore definitely needs to have that buffer. I also found this to be really interesting as well. So when you have kelp forests, it actually kind of creates a highway. So back in the early days, early boaters used to actually use a kelp forest to navigate, and they called it the kelp highway, to go up the coasts. Um, so again, guys, early navigators, early boaters actually used kelps, kelp forests to lead them in a direction. They called it the kelp highway. And also guys, kelp is just important for recreation. So a lot of people go diving in the kelp forest. If you look at our blog posts, um, I have quite a few videos and there's a lot of videos of them recording and diving in the kelp forest. It's very, very cool. So there's a lot of things that live in the kelp forest. Uh, we actually have a lot of invertebrates that live in the kelp forest. So remember an invertebrate does not have a backbone. We've got bristle worms, brittle stars, sea urchins, prawns, and snails. Um, we've also got sea stars. We've got a bunch of different types of fish that live in the kelp forest. There are over 100 species of rockfish, and rockfish are a very important fish species that live in the kelp forest. We have leopard sharks, kelp bass, sheep's heads, and there's another fish that I found that I thought had a funny name. It's called a senorita fish. Um, apparently they have those in the kelp forest as well. They also have mammals, so sea lions, seals, the gray whale, orcas, and sea otters, which we'll talk about soon. Okay, so now I kind of want to talk to you about something that is happening with our kelp forest now. So we know that kelp forest is a very important habitat. It also can be a very important resource for us um, in terms of finding renewable resources for fuel and power. Um, we use it as an ingredient in a lot of different things, but there is something going on. We are losing a lot of our kelp forests. So I think I taught you guys about this during our invertebrate lesson, but the biggest sea star is called the sunflower sea star. It can get very, very big. It has more than five arms. I can try to show you a picture maybe. There you go. So it looks like that. Sorry guys, it's hard for me to show you photos today. Um, but the sunflower sea star has a bunch of arms and it's the biggest sea star species that we have. And they actually live in the kelp forest as well. Now, unfortunately in 2013, there was a huge heat wave. So a heat wave, just think of a big thing of really, really warm weather. And we had a big thing of really warm wa weather that came through and scientists actually nicknamed it the blob. So we had this big heat wave in 2013 named the blob and it came through and it killed a lot of our sunflower sea stars um, that live in the kelp. And we also have the sea star wasting disease. So think about how we have coral disease. The sea stars actually got a disease as well. So with the um, big heat wave and the sea star disease, we had a huge sunflower sea star die off. Now I already saw someone ask this question. Um, I think Chris asked this question and I'm about to get into it. So these sunflower sea stars are um, a predator for the purple sea urchin, okay? So just remember that we lost a lot of those sunflower sea stars and they are a predator of the purple sea urchin. Now another predator that we probably have all heard about at some point, they're very, very cute, are the sea otters. So the sea otters is the primary predator of the purple urchin. What they can do is they can actually crack through their tough spiky bodies to eat the inside meat. A uh, fun fact is that sea otters, their teeth um, will actually turn purple from the color of the sea urchin. Sea otters are what we call a keystone species. Um, so guys, a keystone species is a species that without it, the entire ecosystem would collapse. So keystone species, they're not the same, they're not exactly the same as an apex predator um, because there are things that do eat sea otters there. So the apex predator is not a keystone species. However, or yes, so the apex predator is not necessarily a keystone species, but the sea otter is. So the sea otter, if we take that away, there's a huge collapse in the kelp forest ecosystem, which is a very big issue. 
Another thing that sea otters do, I'm sure you guys have probably heard of this as well, super cute, um, sea otters actually wrap their body with the kelp to prevent them from floating away. So when the otters just kind of want to hang out and relax, they'll actually wrap that kelp around their body so they can stay in one spot. Um, unfortunately, the sea otters were actually hunted near extinction in the 1880s for their meat and their fur. Um, so we almost lost all of our sea otters and since then it's been very hard for them to rebound they've been doing all right but we still don't have as many sea otters as we should have um, and that's a very big issue they also call them the protector of the kelp beds so guys the sea otters are the main predator for that purple sea urchin and we also have the sunflower sea star now with the big decline in the sunflower sea star population and the loss of a lot of sea otters you can imagine that the purple sea urchin is taking over. So the purple sea urchin is devouring the kelp in large amount of numbers. So one count from some scientists found 350 million purple sea urchins in a single Oregon uh, kelp reef area. So that's a lot. Um, that's a 10,000% increase since 2014. Um, and so what scientists have coined the term when you have an area that used to be filled with kelp that is now just sea urchins, they call it urchin barrens. So we are getting a bunch of urchin barrens. So areas where there used to be all this kelp, a thriving ecosystem is now just filled with purple urchins. So guys, um, I also gave you a worksheet on a food web, food chain that you guys can do to make it with the, um, to make it with the kelp ecosystem or if you don't want to do that and you want to do it with any of the other ecosystems you've learned about that's totally fine but remember you know you put that kelp on the bottom the kelp is a producer and then you could have the sea urchin as um, the next level there and remember to put the sea otter in there as well so maybe you could do the kelp the purple purple urchin the sea otter and then maybe even an orca um, they'll eat those sea otters too they'll come in so guys, it's very important to note why that, that this kelp forests are very important to us. Again, like I've said, it's a very important ingredient in a lot of things that we use. It can be a really good fuel alternative so we can stop burning fossil fuels. Um, but with all of the purple urchins coming into play and other issues like climate change. So climate change is a very, very big problem. Um, like I mentioned earlier, kelp loves colder, uh, colder water. And with climate change, we're getting a lot warmer water, which means that our kelp is not having the ideal area for it to grow. So climate change is a big issue. It's also affecting the otters as well. So we're losing a lot of components in the kelp forests, which is causing this big decline. So researchers say that California has actually lost more than 90% of their kelp forests. So I'll say that again. California has lost more than 90% of their kelp forests. That's a huge number. So just like coral reefs, just like mangroves and seagrass, just like the Arctic and Antarctica, our kelp forests are also declining very quickly. And that's not a good thing. There are so many things that you guys can do as well. Again, think about our climate change lesson. Easy things that you guys can do to make a difference. Why don't you guys go ahead and in the comments, comment something you guys can do to battle climate change. What is one thing that you guys can do to help fight climate change? So is it maybe get a reusable water bottle? Maybe drive your car less? What is something that you guys can do in your life to fight climate change? Good job, guys. Yeah, keep keep coming at commenting things that you can do to make a difference. Using less plastic, driving less, consuming less meat, cleaning the beach. All those things are going to be very helpful to combat climate change and just help all of our oceans so much more and all the organisms that live inside of it. All right, guys. So that ends my lesson today on kelp. Go ahead and check out um, the worksheets that I gave you. Use it as a review from this lesson and all the other ecosystem lessons that you've had and compare them, learn more about the ecosystems, kind of do a review. Go ahead and check it out. Thank you guys so much for tuning in and we will see you guys on Friday.